Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. Hello everybody and welcome once again to our online platform. It's always a wonderful blessing to be together. If this is your first time here, I want to invite you to like this video. If it blesses you and send it on to family and friends and also subscribe to the channel, switch on the notifications so that you don't miss anything. We bring messages every week on this platform that are able to enrich your life, transform you because that is God's desire for your life. Today we're starting with a new series called Set Apart from Backsliding. Set Apart from Backsliding. I believe that God is going to do something unique in our lives through this series. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll get into the message. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have set everything in place for us to be established in the faith and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling to the point of getting the outcome of our hope, which is the ultimate eternal life that you have promised us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us wisdom and we pray that you speak to us and give us direction as for how we should go about this. We thank you that you speak to us, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Awesome. So we're talking about being set apart from backsliding. We're going to run this series over the next four weeks. Today we're going to talk about the definition of backsliding. What is this that we call backsliding? The second week we'll talk about the main reasons for backsliding, why it is that people backslide, why they find themselves in a state of backsliding. And then the third week, we'll talk about keys for never backsliding. And yes, I said never, because many people say, ah, never say never. You never know if you're going to get there. You need to make sure that you can be established in the word of the Lord, in the promises and the plan of the Lord, and never backslide. And then the fourth week, we'll talk about the benefits of never backsliding. That's where we want to aim towards. And I know that there's a lot of people that listen to this from different walks of life. You might not even be a Christian yet. One of the reasons that many people are reluctant to commit their lives to Christ is because they say, I don't want to get in and then mess it up. I don't want to get in and then disappoint God. I don't want to get in and be like my Christian friend that backslided and now is in a worse condition than when he started out. And we're going to address all of these things. And the, the, the context that we are going to bring out is also going to highlight that this kind of backsliding doesn't only happen at the individual level. It can actually happen at the level of a nation. It can happen at the, le at the level of a family. It can happen at the level of an organization. Even a church that started off on fire for God and then backslid into a condition of coldness and into a condition of apathy and apostasy. And it is so important that we address this. And so now I, I want to encourage you to really open your heart and to prepare yourself for your heart to be established on this truth. Because I'm telling you, if you can settle this matter We'll talk about it in the fourth week. The exceptional benefits that will come as a result of your faithfulness to God till the end are without comparison. There's a lot of people that make progress and then move backwards. Their life with God is three steps forward and five steps backwards. When you find them, they might even be in a worse condition than when they first began. And it is so important that we address this once and for all. And if you can grasp this, this truth and that the Holy Spirit will help us to have this revelation, I'm telling you it's going to be to the glory of God. All right, so what is backsliding? We're going to deal with this uh, subject today. What is this idea of backsliding? It is important that you understand that God sets us on what is termed to be a race of faith. You know, it's like you are, you are on the path of journeying with God from the moment when you meet him to the point where you get to the everlasting life. And this is obviously the truth is that we have received eternal life. But that eternal life is going to culminate in the, um, in the glorification of our bodies and in us 
entering into the eternal uh, salvation which comes in heaven and the new earth and all of that in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a, a, a right illustration for this idea of backsliding would be what happened with the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. So Moses is sent by God to deliver the people out of Egypt, out of bondage and out of slavery and to bring them into the place where they are going to go into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place of great blessing, a place of great prosperity, a place where everything is awesome. And so God has a plan to get them there. But I promise you, according to the narrative of Scripture and the principles of God, not everyone that leaves Egypt is going to make the promised land. This is hectic. It is so mind-blowing that God, in, in all sorts of miraculous ways, by, by dispossessing all manner of idols and then breaking them out of this prison called Egypt and then taking them through dry land as they parted the Red Sea and then taking them through the wilderness all the way to the margins of the promised land and that some of them then decide that they're going back to Egypt. And it happens many times. It happens many times. Let's look here at the first principle. God doesn't want you to lose what you gain. This is a great definition for backsliding. Losing what you gain. Going back to where you came from. And this is the idea of bondage. That God has set you free. That God has brought you out. That God has transformed your life. That God has delivered you. That he has saved you and your family. That maybe you used to be in trouble in your marriage. Maybe you used to be in trouble in your life. Maybe you used to be in trouble in your friendships, your relationships. Maybe it's even in your workplace, in your faith, walk with God. And so you're making progress and it's month number one, month number two, month number three. Here yeah, by April, things are going and moving. By May, it's moving. June, July, August, September, by November. All of a sudden, you start feeling weird. December, you find yourself in some club somewhere, reminding yourself that maybe this is better than what you gain throughout the year. God does not want you to lose what you gain. And a lot of people have this idea, no, God is sovereign. And, you know, if, if he wants me to remain, I'll remain. If he doesn't want me to remain, I won't remain. No, the word of God doesn't teach that. It speaks about how you need to fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That you mustn't go back. That you must endure even to the point of death. That you must pay whatever price is necessary in order to enter into the rest that God has for you. This is so important. And so many of us over the, uh, the last year, 2024, has been an awesome year and I've made progress and God has just transformed this area of my life and that area of my life. Oh my goodness, I never imagined this kind of amazing miracles, this great God. Wow, it's been awesome. I've never been as on fire, as passionate about the things of God. I've never made so much progress. And I'm telling you now that even though you had a great 2024, what will 2025 look like? Yeah. We know from the word of God that there are temptations and trials and tribulations on the path of those who have chosen the narrow road. And that you have to overcome even until the end. And there is a temptation to slide back there is a temptation to move backwards. There is a temptation to return to the very wickedness that the Lord has delivered you out of. The book of Proverbs speaks of the idea of the, the, the dog returning to its vomit. It speaks of the idea of the pig returning back to wallow in the mud after you wash it. And there are many dynamics to this, yes. 
In many instances, people just fell away because they were never born again in the first place. They were just acting saved or acting Christian. But then there are real instances where people make progress and then they, they give up. Like the idea of, of, of people coming out of Egypt, the, the children of Israel actually came out, actually went through the Red Sea, which represents baptism actually went under the cloud and under the pillar of fire that was there at night, leading them and guiding them. They heard the voice of God. They were involved with all the amazing encounters with God. And then after that, they chose to go back. No way, no way, no way, no way. <laughs> God did not save you to bring you halfway and then to take you back into bondage. All right, now let's look here at the scripture, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. The book of Galatians is a letter from the Apostle Paul with stern warnings to the Galatian church that wanted to go back to Judaism after they have found Christianity. Because Judaism is the precursor for Christianity. But Christianity is focused on Christ, the Messiah, which is the fulfillment of the Jewish promises. And they wanted to go back to the blood of bulls and goats and the rituals of the temple when they had the reality of Christ and his blood and his sacrifice and his atonement and his power and his grace and his mercy. And so the apostle Paul was livid and he, he really rebuked them. He said, who has bewitched you? You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you in chapter two? Then he gets to chapter five. And this is the one-liner that I love, and I just wanted to highlight here. This is in the Good News Translation. It says, freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people, and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. Awesome. This is exactly the idea that we were communicating about to say that the people came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt, but when they came to the promised land, whatever trials and troubles they faced caused them to have some kind of nostalgia to the time when they were in bondage and slaves. And they felt like, maybe it wasn't that bad. <laughs> maybe living in sin and bondage and feeling like, the weight of the world is crushing me down and I'm, I'm, I've got a meaningless life. I'm just like a rock spinning through the universe. No purpose, no direction, no meaning. Love feels empty. Maybe, that, maybe that's not that bad <laughs> compared to this church tree or this Jesus thing. And there's a lot of people the reason why they end up there, and we'll talk about this down the line as to the reasons why people backslide, that will be next week. But many times, some kind of disappointment came in, some kind of disillusionment came in, some kind of pain came in, some kind of confusion came in, and a lot of deception came. And so it is important that we look at Galatians 5 says, do not allow yourself to become a slave again. If it was up to God, the Apostle Paul would not have said, don't allow yourself. It means that it is within your power to allow yourself to be in bondage again. It was never God's will. Don't say, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. If God wants me to be free, I will be free. If God doesn't want me to be free, I will not be free. It doesn't work like that. Even Moses had to persuade the people of Israel to come out of Egypt because many of them were saying, no man, back in Egypt we had garlic, we had leeks, we had all sorts of wonderful spices. Now here in the wilderness, it's just manna every day, manna bread, manna, manna every day. Quails and whatnot, but in Egypt things were not all that bad. I felt suicidal every now and then. I had my depression and anxiety every now and then, but nothing that the doctor couldn't medicate and I couldn't pass through with a little bit of meditation. No, we, we were not called into positive thinking. We were not called into some semblance of freedom. We were actually set free from darkness to light, 
from bondage into freedom into Christ. And we are not going to find anything better out there in Egypt in the past. And so this is the first principle. God doesn't want you to lose what you gained. He doesn't want you to backslide. Jeremiah also touches on this. He says, a voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. And you know, uh, Jeremiah was an unfortunate prophet because he, they called him a, prof, a weeping prophet, a prophet of doom. Because he was telling Israel, my goodness, you guys have fallen from grace. You have turned away from the Lord and judgment is coming. And so he says, for they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God, the same God that brought them out of Egypt and made them a nation. Then he says in verse 22, this is the New King James Version. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come. It says, indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord, our God. And so this is the response where the prophet says, God is speaking. Return, you backsliding children, return, and I will heal you of your backslide. We're going to talk in the next few weeks about how God restores a backslidden heart. And I'm speaking to some of you. You might be out there. You haven't been in church for four years. But there was a time when you said you got born again. There was a time when you got baptized and you even spoke in tongues. There was a time when you were serving in, in the church. And then you fell far from that because of some deception, some disappointment, some deception, some kind of thing that came in, some pain, some church hurt. That came in. And so you decided to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, the church people, I don't like them. So the Jesus, I will also just discard. And you have thrown away your very life. But God is saying, return, O backslider. And I will heal you of your backsliding. And then the response is, indeed, we do come to you. For you are the Lord, our God. If you look at another version of the same scripture, whether it be in the ESV or in the LSB, that you will see that the original term for backsliding is for being faithless. It is the idea of unfaithfulness. It would be the same as saying that a cheating spouse is a backsliding spouse. That someone that doesn't hold to their promise and ruins and rips apart their marriage because of their unfaithfulness, has backslided, has backslided from their original covenant. And this is the idea that a lot of people, they play around and toy around with the prospect that maybe I'll backslide, but then I'll be here next weekend again just to confess my sins and be washed again and all of that. And we're going to deal with how this kind of thing is destructive. You will find yourself in a place where you are not sure whether you are saved. You will not have a confidence and assurance of salvation. And so the word is backsliding. The idea is faithlessness or unfaithfulness. That you, you started off your, your faith journey and then halfway you give up. You need to endure to the end. God does not want you to lose what you gained. Not even for a moment. You know, some, uh, some of you might be thinking, oh no, it's just here and there. I just gave up a little bit. It's just only for a weekend. It's only for one month. I'll be back. I'm just taking a sabbatical from God. I'm just chilling a little bit. I've I'm, I'm been doing this church thing too much. That's like someone saying, let me just pause my breathing for one day. Let me just stop breathing for one week. Well, I'm just breathing all the time. You know, it's just so compulsive and all the time I have to breathe in, out, in, out, in, out. I'm getting tired of this breathing. Uh, you need to repent of that kind of mentality. And you need to begin to adjust yourself. And begin to realize that Christ is your life. There is no day or night for backsliding, no minute, no second for backsliding. But we are also talking about those 
who are in the faith. You have not gone to the club or gone to uh, your old fornications, but you are not as on fire as you used to be. You used to love God with so much passion, so much commitment. You have lost your first love. You have backslided from that place. The book of Revelation, Jesus speaking to one of the churches, he says that, look, I only have this thing against you. You have left your first love. Return to your first love. You have left your first love. Return to your first love. So this is very important. The second principle that we're going to touch on today is that you need to look forward to move forward. You need to look forward to move forward. The children of Israel, many of them, they looked backwards. They remembered the days in Egypt. They remembered the good old days. You know, let me say this. Even the life of sin, you know, the life of a sinner, you will see them happy every now and then. <laughs> and so those are the happy days that they go back and remember. Because sometimes when you now decide to follow Jesus, all hell breaks loose. And all of a sudden, things that used to be easy for you are now no longer easy because the devil is your enemy that used to help you in the past. Now he's like, oh, you think I'm going to help you now? I'm against you, my friend. You have become my enemy. Let's fight. And so a lot of times you start thinking, why are things not working out? I thought that if I can give my life to Christ, then everything will work out. Not necessarily my friend. There's a lot of people that the moment they decided to get born again, they were disowned by their family, rejected by their parents. Well, it was fine when they were just a religious guy sleeping around every now and then, uh, drinking when they wanted, as long as they stayed in that traditional church. But once you decide now that well, I'm going to really now be fully born again, I'm not even going to be baptized in water, not just sprinkled, but baptized in water, I'm going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. I'm going to move in the power, prophesying and, and moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, evangelizing and all. All of a sudden, your family thinks that you are a weirdo. Now, come on, brother, calm, calm yourself down. Why? Because you're showing up their religiosity. You're showing up the fact that there is more and they are not going for it. And so now all of a sudden, you have are, you are given up those old friendships. You have given up, and now you are ex struggling with some loneliness. Sometimes you feel like, you know, you, you need friends, but, you know, you, you're still waiting for your new Christian friends to be formed and all of that, and it's a little bit tough. Sometimes you used to have a business that was based on your alcoholism, based on your gambling, based on your debauchery, based on your flirting, and now it's dried up because you can't anymore conduct the enterprises of satanic lifestyles. And so now you have to come to a holy life and you, you can't drive anymore. Those tenders used to flow because the brown envelope used to go. But now you have to block that and just do honest applications and you're like, this ain't going to work. <laughs> it's, it's tough now. I'm reminded of the one gentleman that got saved, all of that radically. He used to be addicted to crack cocaine and all of that, and with all sorts of illicit businesses, arrested every now and then. And then he got saved, gave all of that up, or gave up all the alcohol in an instant. The Lord just delivered him. And then he called me the one time and he said, I'm, I'm going back. I'm, I'm leaving this Christianity thing. He, he told God and his wife that I'm going to sin because it's not financially viable. And he, he went to the one government institution where he used to bribe. Then he said, today I'm going to bribe. He went with his papers and all. And as he was at the counter handling things and all, he found himself doing things every, every step of the way completely right. Completely right. And he, he didn't bribe. <laughs> he turned around from the counter when he was done, walked to his car and he cried. And he said, I'm again, becoming weak. He was so disappointed. He said, what's wrong with me? How can I, I could have had $10,000 today by inflating some invoice or something. And, but, but there's something in us that says, I can't, I can't go back. 
I can't go back. I can't look back. I've got something better for it. And today, his business has turned around. He's doing much better, honest business, and things are well. I'm going to read for us here from Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 on. And this is the Apostle Paul addressing this matter. And he, he addresses it, obviously, from the context of not someone who falls away all the way into the world, but even someone who is in the church who is saved, but you used to be ahead. You are not supposed to lose what you gain. Next year, you're supposed to be in more impact, more fruitful than the previous year. It should be glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith. Philippians chapter 3, it starts off here with verse 8. He says, he says Indeed, I count, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from, that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see, faith versus faithlessness or unfaithfulness. Then verse 10 says, that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You see, the Apostle Paul, his willingness to identify with Christ, he left his old life where he was killing Christians and religious men. Now he's living for Christ no matter the cost. Verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, his vision is forward-looking. Then in verse 12, he says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Then he goes to verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, let those of us who, who are mature think this way. And this is the wonderful thing that you need to be discipled. We'll talk to you about how to make sure you never backslide. You need to be discipled into this kind of mentality. Because a lot of people have a quitting mentality. And he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Then he says in verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let us hold on to what we have gained. Then verse 17, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's starting now to give us the keys how you stay without falling backwards. And then he says, verse 18, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is in their pride, is in their shame. With minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. I love the word of God and it speaks in every area of our lives. He says to us, I press on, I look forward, I don't look backward. There's nothing behind for me. I strain to the upward call of God that God called me toward. And then he says, let's hold on to what we have gained. Let's not let it go. It is something that you mustn't allow. 
The tempter wants to steal your testimony. The devil wants to destroy your life. He wants your end to be destruction. He wants your belly to be your God, your body and your pleasure to be your God. He wants you to live according to your feelings instead of your faith. But today I'm here to tell somebody <laughs> that God is going to heal you of your backsliding if you are willing to take this medication. What medication are we talking about? This truth that we are preaching. These messages over the next four weeks, we are going to teach you the doctrines of faithfulness that you will endure till the end and nothing will shake you. And in the end, you will hear those words, well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You will not be those who said, Lord, but we were at church. We did this and that and that. And in the end, we gave. Thank you, Lord. So this is the first principle. God does not want you to lose what you gain. Secondly, look forward and move forward. You are, you are in a race, and it is a marathon. <laughs> it is not a hundred meters dash. You are going to need perseverance and endurance. The reality is, and we'll teach that next week and the week after, that God has given us everything to make us prosperous in, in this journey of faith. Each one of us that start this race can finish it with great blessing. I want to pray for you if you're out there. You're in a state where you have started to backslide or you are backsliding. You want to repent of that today. I want to pray for you. And I want to ask that you will repent in your heart and say, Lord, wow, I've allowed the enemy to lie. I'm not going to allow that in. Right now in Jesus' name, be set free from that backsliding mentality. Be set free from every voice that speaks to you that says, turn back and go back to bondage. Pray with me. Say, say, say to the Lord, say, Lord, Today, I humble myself. I refuse to turn back. I'm coming back to you. Restore my heart. Establish my faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You might be out there and you're not born again. You have never given your life to Christ. You might be a church person, but you, you think that born again is the church name. No, being born again means that new life comes into you that your sins are forgiven, that you are a new creation. If you want to receive Jesus today as your personal Lord and Savior, you might say, I'm not ready. You don't need to be ready. You just need to be a sinner who wants to be saved. And so Jesus is available because you already paid the price. Pray with me to receive Jesus. Say with me, Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus died for me that he suffered in my place, that he took upon himself the punishment for my sin, and that in three days he was raised from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son. Today I receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, as my master, as my healer, as my God. From today, I repent of my sins. I give up my old life and I receive new life. Lord Jesus, I invite you, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Be my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. From today, I receive new life right now. I receive forgiveness of sins right now. I receive eternal life right now. I receive a new heart and a new spirit right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you pray that, we believe that a miracle has happened in your heart. Please reach out to us on all the details that you see on this video. And if you're in town, please join us in the service. Amen. This is going to be a tremendous series. I'm so excited. We just started off today. We're going to continue next week. You don't want to miss it. Please, if you're in town, join us in the service and continue to share this message out. There are people that have gone far from the Lord. They're going to come back 
Many prodigals are coming back to the Father even during the series. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For any additional information, please visit our website on ianvintook.org.